I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is the fight to reopen California. San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner is here to discuss his plan to reopen hair and nail salons now. Pastor Jim Franklin of Fresno's Cornerstone Church on his plan to reopen his church regardless of what the governor says. Plus, Democratic strategist Bob Schrump and Republican strategist Mike Murphy on the politics of all this and who Biden should pick as his VP. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. Our first guest is one of the leading voices saying California Governor Gavin Newsom isn't moving fast enough in reopening the state. Joining us via Skype from San Diego, home of our affiliate Fox 5 San Diego, is Kevin Faulkner. Since 2014, the Republican has served as mayor of San Diego. He's in his final year in that role. He's been on our show before talking about his plan to combat homelessness by banning tents from the streets of San Diego. This week, San Diego was one of several counties around the state given the go-ahead by the governor to move into the next phase of reopening. That means one where restaurants can open for dine-in service with restriction. But Mayor Faulkner wants to go even further. Mayor Kevin Faulkner, welcome back to The Issue Is. Alex, great to be back with you, thank you. So one of the, the key things in your plan is you wanna see hair salons, nail salons, you say they should be able to open now. Describe your plan, how would it work? Yeah, well, we've asked on behalf of the county, and, it, and again, it was United, myself, our, our county public officials that, that took a vote, our board of supervisors, and our, as I said, our, our, our county public health, um, to say we're into phase two now uh, with dine-in restaurants, uh, the ability for in-store retail, but we've said give us the opportunity to pilot moving into phase three, and of course, when we're talking about phase three, we're talking things about hair salons, uh, gyms. Um, and our perspective, Alex, has really been, as we continue to reopen, to do it safely, to do it in conjunction with our public health officials, and make sure that folks are, are following the rules of the road. So how do you do it right? I mean, what is that pilot? What could that look like for the state? It's not about going back to normal, right? It's about what's the new normal? So how do you do things differently in terms of everything from employee education, you know, sanitary, physical distancing, the number of folks inside, masks, all of that. It's about the new normal and getting ready so we can actually continue to open our economy uh, and to do it safely. As we've said this week, you know, folks could go into a, a Target and, and buy clothes. Why couldn't they be able to go into their local retailer uh, and do the same thing? So let's talk for a moment about Governor Newsom's handling of all this. So, you know, there are rumors that you may run against the governor at some point uh, for his office. What's your working relationship like? And do you feel like the governor is listening to you on this? Look, it's important that we all work together at, at every level, whether, you know, mayors, local mayors across the state, our board of supervisors. Uh, we want our state to succeed. Again, we all want to come out of this safely in every part of the state. And I think that when we do that, we work together, that's our best opportunity for success. I mean, but do you think that the governor is listening to what you're saying? And, and do you think that he may go along with your, your pilot program? What have those conversations been like? Well, I'll tell you, we asked to, to move into phase two because we believe we met those requirements. And the answer was yes. We've also said, let us now pilot uh, going into phase three because we're ready. San Diegans have taken this seriously. Um, and so I'm optimistic uh, that we will be allowed to do that. Uh, let's talk about the issue of beaches, because when you think about San Diego, some of the best beaches, of course, in the entire country there, you guys were ahead of the curve when it comes to getting beaches back open again with this idea of right. you can't sit on the sand. But there's a lot of people that are like, why can't we sit on the sand from six feet apart? Where it's Memorial right. Day weekend, this weekend, uh, there's the summer's coming up. I mean, at, at what point is this gonna stop? Yeah, it's a phased uh, process. I think you're going to continue to see some changes uh, here come up in San Diego next week. Uh, and to your point, what, what I really wanted to do is I wanted to say, let's act as one region. So I got all of my fellow mayors and other beach cities in San Diego County. I said, let's develop a plan by our lifeguards in conjunction with our public health folks. So we have one clear rules of the road for all beach cities in San Diego. Uh, and people get it. And when, when you lay it out and you say, here's what we, we're asking you to do. Um, you know, you can run, you can walk, you can jog, you can get back into the water now, you can swim and you can surf. Uh, but we want to make sure that everybody's having that physical distancing, close some of the boardwalks. And you know what? Over the last three weeks, it's worked remarkably well. 
plan has been used in other parts of the state. I think that's a good thing. I've really tried to put a little common sense to it. Uh, and again, give people that, uh, that something that they can shoot for, and they're going to do it. All right, Mayor Kevin Faulkner, great to see you. Mayor, we like to play music on the show, so this week we're playing some Blink-182 for you and their song, <laughs> San Diego. Good, I like it. Thank you. Mayor, thank you so much. Uh, great to see you. And uh, as, oh, as, you. As, as we love to say, San Diego is America's finest city. <laughs> thank you very much. Mayor oh, Kevin Faulkner, up next, the future of churches. Stay with us. More of the issue is right for this. There should be no quarantine on religious freedom. The right that is Pastor Jim Franklin of the Cornerstone Church in Fresno. Pastor Franklin says he's opening up his church with social distancing by May 31st, whether the governor gives the approval or not. President Trump, by the way, agrees with him. Today I'm identifying houses of worship, churches, synagogue, and mosques as essential places that provide essential services. Pastor Jim Franklin joins us via Skype from Fresno, home of our affiliate Fox 26. Pastor, welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. So Governor Newsom saying at the end of this week that he is going to be unveiling at the beginning of next week his guidelines for reopening churches. What do you want to see in those guidelines? We just want to be treated fairly. We just want to be treated like every other business that has been allowed to open uh, with the obvious CDC guidelines. But if somebody can go into a big box store, if somebody can go sit down at a restaurant, if they can walk down an aisle and pick up a home improvement item, why can't they walk down our aisle, sit in a pew and get something that'll help improve their lifestyle? We just want to be treated fairly. And so you're, you're going to be reopening kind of no matter what he says. What's your plan? We plan on opening on the 31st. Uh, we've had that plan in place now for several weeks. And uh, with the proper CDC guidelines, social distancing, sanitation, uh, all of those to keep people safe. Uh, we want to keep people safe. Uh, these are not our customers that are walking through our doors. These are parishioners. I've pastored here for over a quarter of a century. I've known these people. I've, I've buried their loved ones. I've married their children. I've been with them in the good times and the bad times. If anybody wants to keep people safe, uh, it, it's pastors. What do you make of the way that Governor Newsom has handled this? Have you talked to him? Has anybody on your team talked to him or his team about how to do this? We've been in contact with his office over the last several weeks. We've submitted our plans, at least I think now two and a half weeks ago, of how we would we open. We were a little concerned that he put us in phase three. He put us with the entertainment industry. Uh, we're not a part of the entertainment industry. We believe that we provide an essential service, which the president now has said that he agrees with us, that is very necessary during these times. When people are losing hope, people are in fear, where better than go to places of worship to be able to get that type of help? Just like food places need to be open, just like hospitals need to be open, churches should have been open from the very beginning. Let, let's talk about what that's going to look like. What does your plan specifically look like of how you can do this safely? Well, of course, if Walmart can figure out how to do it, I think churches can figure out how to do it. And it's it's social distancing. Uh, so we've set up those guidelines where we keep people distanced, uh, where we bring them in through one entry. Uh, we set them. We have a large auditorium. We're in a historic theater built in 1926. Uh, so we have a large auditorium. People will be able to space out. Then they will X out a different door. It will not have children's ministry. We're encouraging those that are vulnerable, those elderly, if they feel any risk whatsoever, we encourage them not to come. We'll be streaming online. They can enjoy that. But this is something we believe people are asking for and wanting, and that's to come back into houses of worship. Let's talk for a moment about the, the mental health crisis that's underway right now throughout our state and throughout our country. A lot of times people do come to church um, for help in dealing with that, for healing. What do you say to people right now who are anxious, who are scared, and who are hurting? Well, I think that's uh, just as you mentioned, where we're seeing the numbers rise that are astronomical. Uh, suicides now are, are going off the chart, and churches are where people can get a message of hope, can get some encouragement. We have so many churches that have help groups for those that have found themselves in addiction, and because they've not been able to meet, and sadly, many of them are going back into those addictions or for anger problems, domestic violence. We see all those numbers rising. That's why coming back to church 
hearing a message of hope, reuniting. Even though we can't hug each other and shake each other's hands, we can stand there in proximity to each other and worship God together. Uh, so we like to play music on this show. I know it's your first time on this show. So we are playing some music from your choir <laughs> during one of the live streams. You guys have been providing music. I know it's such an important thing. Uh, we'll bring this up. Um, and this is really a, a beautiful thing. What do you think is the message of hope that people can get from the music that your team has been providing? Well, when people gather together for worship, and that's our youth team there from our youth services, but when people gather together and they worship together, they sing together, there's something special that, happens that can't happen any other place. There is something special that happens when people gather together and sing together. Thank you very much. Uh, God bless you, sir. And thank you so much for being here and sharing your views. Thank you, Alex. God bless you. Up next, the politics of all this. Mike Murphy, Bob Schrump. Stay with us. More of the issue is after this. It's going to change politics profoundly. Yeah. Uh, for example, as this thing builds up in the next two or three months, are we going to have these giant 18,000 person rallies? Or are politicians going to have to communicate in a different way? People think yeah. the economy is in trouble. Let, let's, He's done. Bob Schrump's predictions turned out to be pretty spot on back on March 6th. That was the first time we talked about coronavirus on this show. And the last time we had a full panel in the studio. I miss those days. Real live human interaction. Remember what that was like in person? Bob and Mike Murphy are back with us via Skype from Los Angeles, home of Fox 11 Los Angeles. Bob, one of the top Democratic strategists on his side. Mike, one of the top Republican strategists on his side. Bob and Mike work together as co-directors of the USC Dornsif Center for the Political Future. Back in February, which seems like about 15 years ago, they co-hosted our town hall with Mayor Pete Buttigieg at USC. Mike is co-host of one of my favorite podcasts. It's with him and David Axelrod. It's called Hacks on Tap, where they discuss the week's political news with some of the smartest minds in politics. It really is must-listen stuff. Bob, Mike, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good to see you both. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. Uh, Bob, let, let's start with you. Uh, we heard what you said about coronavirus a couple months ago. Uh, what do you think of, of the job that, that President Trump has done, uh, and how do you think this has shaken up the race? Uh, I don't think he's done a good job at all. In fact, I think it has totally recontoured the race. Uh, the president was hoping he could run on the state of the economy. Uh, he clearly can't do that at this point. But what they're going to do is throw every piece of dirt on the, that they can get hold of uh, up at the wall and hope something sticks uh, to uh, Joe Biden. Because their polling shows that they don't have any single big argument that does Biden in. Mike, your assessment of the Trump campaign right now. Well, there's no doubt the virus has infected and taken over American politics. It's been very hard for Joe Biden to get a platform to really compete. But he's still doing well because, frankly, he's not Trump. And Donald Trump has had a lot of negatives before this. But as Bob said, he had the argument on the economy. So over the last five weeks, the opinion of people on who's better to run the economy it used to be about nine points in Trump's direction. It's declined to three points. The economy was the only thing he had. Uh, Mike, you had on your show Hacks on Tap this week. You had Rahm Emanuel, who, of course, was the former yes. chief of staff to Barack Obama, former mayor of Chicago, former aide to Bill Clinton, uh, a Democrat, who said that the Democrats are screwing up the politics of this. His argument was essentially that President Trump is trying to position himself as I'm the guy to reopen the country and Democrats should be I'm the guys for rebuilding. Instead, it's I'm the guy for not reopening the country. Do you agree with, with his analysis? Do you think that the Democrats have misplayed this a bit? Yes, I do. It's interesting. Ram and I got into a kind of comedy slappy fight on the Exxon Tap podcast over we kept agreeing and it was driving us both crazy. The argument Ram made, and I totally agree with it, is rather than be the national scolds, you know, with bow ties on television saying, stay home, lose your house, don't earn anything. It's all right. Uh, instead, here's the Democratic plan to rebuild America and bring us back, including policy, things like infrastructure, to go on the offense on this and not sit there and kind of the, be a punching bag for Trump, where in states where there's less infection, and we now know younger people are a lot less vulnerable, 
the Dems are preaching, no, you can never go back to war, you know, just get ready for a, a huge recession or depression. Bob, let, let's talk for a moment about the Democratic response to this. I tweeted out uh, earlier this week saying uh, Biden's poll numbers are way up because he's sitting at his home and not saying anything. And then all of a sudden, towards the end of the week, he decided to say something. He went on Charlemagne the God's show uh, and talked about the African-American community in, in a way that didn't work out all that well for him. Take a look. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump and you ain't black. So uh, <laughs> Biden had to come out and say that that was uh, not a great thing to have said. He's not taking the African-American community for granted, that that was a cavalier statement, had to backtrack from that. Uh, but we can't really remember him saying all that much, but it seems like some of these times when he does, he screws up the message, right, Bob? No, uh, this is a, a press obsession. Uh, it's obviously tr something the Trump campaign jumps on. I've known Joe Biden for 40 years. He's always done stuff like this. I don't think the voters care. This will be the embarrassing thing of the day, but it's not going to rock Biden's connection to African-American voters. That's what put him there. Now, I do believe that Biden needs a first act. People don't know Biden as well, <clears throat> excuse me, as the Washington media echo chamber assumes they do. So Biden's got to get out there and tell his story. But putting Biden in a position where you know Joe's a malaprop machine, that he's going to do what the old Vegas club owners used to call, oh, no, the town's drunk, he's going to start going off the act, is risky. My view is the campaign ought to be strategically cautious, Biden should, with things like VP picks, but tactically every day with surrogates, be very aggressive beating on Trump. And there's a lot of pressure on Biden to up his game. So th this was definitely a stumble, but I, I doubt it will make a material difference. When we come back, I want to talk about the VP pick situation with both of you guys. And as you know, we like to play music here. Politics, such a high pressure environment. This week, Jimmy Fallon and The Roots performed under pressure from home using classroom instruments. This is pretty amazing. I know Bob is always looking for more Queen, so this is for you, Bob. <laughs> more of the VP stakes right after this. Stay with us. Uh, uh, believe me, believe me, there's something wrong here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go talk to my shaman about where I took the wrong turn, but. <laughs> That was Republican strategist Mike Murphy agreeing with Democratic strategist Rahm Emanuel on Mike's podcast, Hacks on Tap. Mike, back with us along with his co-director for the USC Center for the Political Future, Bob Shrum. Uh, guys, let's talk for a moment about the VP stakes. Uh, who do we think, Mike, let's start with you, would be the smartest pick for Joe Biden politically? This, of course, is somebody, both of you, who have helped to run presidential campaigns. Who do you think, Mike? Well, not knowing the vetting, I would go with Klobuchar, uh, Senator from Minnesota, or the Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan. And my argument is Biden needs a good governing partner to avoid risk. For governing, though, I'd go with Gina Raimondo, governor of Rhode Island, who won't do anything for you politically, but is the best Democratic governor in the country, I think, on fiscal issues. And Biden's going to have a heavy lift next year if he wins because of the cost of this pandemic. Uh, I doubt because of her problems with the public employee unions or ever pick her, but she would be a smart governing partner. Of course, the person that the Republican strategists want may not be the person that the Democratic base is going for as well. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Bob, uh, you're, you're as somebody who's maybe more in line with the Democratic base. What, what do you think? <laughs> well, Mike, Mike always brings up Gina Raimondo, and it's not going to happen. I think that the most likely pick, the person Biden is probably going to settle on is going to be Kamala Harris. Uh, uh, there's a lot of pressure to have an African-American running mate. African-Americans had a huge amount to do with Biden becoming the nominee. Uh, she's going to be very good in, in, in debates, I think. Let me push back for a second on Kamala Harris. First off, we know that uh, he's going to win California no matter what. And secondly, right. even when it comes to African-Americans, Joe Biden is more popular with African-Americans than Kamala Harris is. If Kamala Harris was so popular with African-Americans, she would have won South Carolina. So why well, would you pick somebody like that? When you look at Michigan, for example, in 2016, and at the decline in the African-American vote, 
you look at the decline in the African-American vote in Pennsylvania, and you, you say to yourself, you know, you really do want to motivate African-Americans to go out there and do the job. I think Kamala Harris would be a terrible, disastrous choice. Two reasons. <laughs> one, she was a disastrous candidate. Her one good day came when she stabbed Biden in the eye, something I think he remembers, with kind of a phony <laughs> attack, nor could she sustain it. Second, as you said, Alex, you don't need to win California more. You, go, you need to do well in places like North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, and Arizona. She is risky. Trump is a racist. He will make it a war about slave reparations and other stuff she's been for that Biden hasn't been for and will succeed at least partially in helping Trump do what he wants to do. Change the topic from fire Trump to what's wrong with Biden. Biden was not a great presidential candidate in 2008. He was a terrific vice presidential candidate. Uh, l l you know, it's interesting that Biden said that he has to pick a woman. If he hadn't, there probably would be a lot of talk about some of the governors that are males around the country, like Andrew Cuomo or like California's governor, Gavin Newsom, right now. Mike, what do you make of the way that Gavin Newsom has handled all of this and, and the politics of this going forward for him? Look, I, I am happy to criticize Gavin, but on this one, I think he's done a great job. He was early, smart and strong. Hell, he was earlier than Cuomo. And, well, I don't think it means anything for this election cycle. He's building a story that in 2024, depending on the political environment, he, he's getting to the point where he could be a credible presidential candidate in the Democratic nomination field. Bob Trump, last word to you. Newsom closed the state early. He saved tens of thousands of lives. I think he's done a terrific job. And I think he's now doing a pretty good job, in fact, an excellent job, of managing the complicated politics of reopening. Well, it is great to talk uh, with both of you. Um, we've missed having a political panel. It's the first time we've done this. And, and to end the week, Bob, I'm going with your favorite show of the week, of course, which is The Masked Singer, right? The biggest show on TV. Uh, so this was the, the big winner. This was the winning moment. Uh, Mike was celebrating. He took off his mask to watch this show this week. I don't know what it says about America that this is the biggest show on TV by a mile, but I guess it says something. <laughs> so we appreciate we appreciate the ratings. Bob here. and I are doing it next year. Yeah, I'm working next year, on my costume. Ne next year, can't wait to see it. Uh, thank you guys, uh, and uh, since you're USC you. guys, fight on, gentlemen. Fight on, <laughs> absolutely. Fight on. Thanks, thank guys, you. for watching. Watching the issue is. We'll see you next week.